I'd like to ask you first to perform a bit of a visual experiment with me here. This is a picture of school children in Haiti that I took about a year and a half ago. Now, I've always been motivated to help young people realize their goals in life. This is why I became a teacher. It informs why I do what I do, why I study what I study. I think all of us have a bit of an intrinsic motivation to help kids realize their goals in life. Otherwise, the species might not survive, right? But I think that this picture, with all of the happy, smiling faces that you see, doesn't really capture that. So take a look at this one. I found this one much more effective. Simple, elegant, it gives you something to focus on, right? That super cute little green laptop right in the middle of it all that promises a better education and a brighter future for that little girl and all of those little girls, right? Well, <laughs> I hope I may have convinced you, but I actually hope most of you caught me in making an unacceptable shortcut between laptop and brighter future, where I cut out all of the human work that goes on, partnership, commitment to doing that hard work, etc. But I believe we can make progress. Technology for development. What am I talking about? Well, it's a field that's very exciting to be a part of right now because there's so much attention to it, so much activity going on in it. But it's also a field that tends to hyperbole and outrageous claims for quick results to be seen because we have technology. And always looking for the next big thing, which I feel is kind of because we're focusing too much on the technology and not enough on the development. So, what is technology? What is development? Well, the definition of technology, pretty straightforward. I found this definition and I copy-pasted it. The definition of development, not so straightforward. I wasn't satisfied with what I found, so I made my own. And believe me, I'm not the first person out there to struggle with the definition of development. Development, increasing the opportunities, freedoms, and capabilities of human beings. Definition number two, <laughs> a difficult, complicated, messy process with no shortcuts and no quick fixes. Tougher to define, tougher to wrap your head around, and tougher to apply something so straightforward as technology to something so, well, messy, complicated, and difficult. But therein lies a temptation, possibly a trap. So perhaps we need to stop focusing directly on the technology. Last May, I was very fortunate to be able to make a presentation to a group of ambassadors from around the world who had come to IIT and I got to tell them about a project that I'm working on with students there. This project is to bring solar power to primary schools in Haiti. And we're working on best practices such as sustainability, scalability, um, partnering with the state university there and professors and students. And we're also working with the One Laptop Per Child project because they were formed as a donation um, of laptops went to Haiti. Now, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure that what my audience, the ambassadors, heard was wah, 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 one laptop per child. Because that's what all the questions were about. First question, I come from a very poor country. We could really benefit from those laptops. How much do the laptops cost? I was ready for that question. I was prepared for it. So my answer went something along the lines of, well, it's more complicated than you might think because you have to think of a power source. Do you have a reliable power source? If not, you may need to build infrastructure. What about a deployment model? Not only do you have to consider the upfront costs, but also maintenance and repair over the long haul. You'll probably need to train technicians. You certainly need to train teachers. They've never used laptops before. You'll also need to train them how to use them in the education. In addition, you need to involve the parents and the community. So if you can come up with a price tag for that, I'll let you know that the laptops also cost about $200 each. Now, unfortunately, I'm fairly certain that the ambassadors still heard wah, 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 $200 each. <laughs> Which is part and parcel of 
focusing on the technology. This is an area full of well-intentioned people trying to do great things in the world. But as I say, always looking for the next big thing. So how can we move past that? How can we stop looking for the next big thing? Maybe we need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And for that, let's have a brief history lesson, because we know what happens to people who don't pay attention to history, right? OK, I will keep it brief to give you an overview of the great and grand development agenda that has taken place mostly since World War II, which corresponds to when most of what we consider the developing world now started to gain at least political independence from the former colonies. Just before World War II ended, the countries that were participating in it came together and formed some organizations in order to facilitate the um, rebuilding of Europe. They did a great job, these organizations, because Europe redeveloped. And then these organizations no longer had a purpose. So they repurposed themselves as development organizations. These development organizations are variously known as the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Now, to KISS. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. Familiar to technologists and engineers, right? Along Einstein's maxim, everything should be kept as simple as possible, but no simpler. But did you also know that Einstein said, politics is more difficult than physics? Why? Because atoms behave predictably. Human beings are perfectly capable of not behaving predictably or rationally. And they um, interact within a society, just like we saw in the previous presentation. Back to KISS. So what do you get when you try to apply Keep It Simple Stupid to the great and grand development challenges? Well, the search for simple explanations and universally applicable applications. Or, if you will, the search for the missing X factor. Variously over time, the missing X factor has been deemed to be physical capital. We started out with that because that's what Western Europe was missing, right? But it turned out that the developing countries needed more than this. So we kept looking for the next one big missing thing. Now I'll remind you that these are very well-intentioned people applying the KISS principle to the complex job of development. And I'm pretty sure that they did their best, too. But after we went through this whole list and the development agenda isn't accomplished, well, today we see that technology is the new missing X factor. But you know what? Technology isn't going to do a better job of solving all of the development problems than any one of these factors did before. Because when we talk about development, we're talking about an ecosystem, a complex ecosystem, difficult social, political, economic issues that we have to deal with. Technology doesn't make them go away, right? We have to start building institutions, norms, rules, and structure. And this is where it gets dry. <clears throat> I made a, a brief list of some of the structures and institutions that we need to work on in developing countries. Now, before I lose you and your eyes glaze over, the point of this, what I'd like to take you um, to see is that if we choose any one of these, let's take businesses of all sizes. Great, we want to develop businesses of all sizes. But for that, we need good governance, open and fair markets, enforcement of property rights. You see where I'm going here. It's an ecosystem. They're all interrelated. There are no shortcuts. There's no one missing X factor that's going to solve all of these things. And by the way, the developed countries didn't take any shortcuts, didn't have any missing X factor. So it is an amazing and wonderful thing that there are countries out there that have all of these ecosystem things in place to the point where we can take them for granted, which is one reason why we miss the boat in the development scenario. We take things for granted once we can. That's human nature. So how do we get away from that? Suggestion number one, start working with people who don't take the entire ecosystem for granted because it doesn't exist for them. People in, in the developing world who have a very clear vision of what it is that they want and need. 
This is École Notre Dame in Mboro, Senegal. I visited there in uh, August of 2009, just before they were about to deploy a Computers in the Schools project. All of the ducks were lined up in a row. Great things were going to happen. They had electricity. They had internet connectivity. They had a headmaster who was a project champion. He had been trying to get computers in the schools for four years. He had the parents on board. This project was the talk of the town because the teachers were recalled for summer school training and how to use computers. Same for the kids. Once the kids came, whew, the town was electric, right? All of these good things in place. And Pierre proudly took me on a tour of his school. And the first place that he took me to was the toilets. And he proudly told me that a year before, a French NGO had contacted him to ask, what can we do for you? How can we help? And he thought long and hard about this. And he said, you know what? We need toilets. He had been trying for three years to, at that point to get computers into his schools. Toilets before technology. Or perhaps more precisely, lose before laptops. Because don't forget, toilets are technology. And then a year later, they got their computers. And all of those best practices that I mentioned before did lead to a very vibrant experience for these kids and these teachers. Not without problems, however, but we will come back to that. Again, working with people who know what their needs are. If necessity is the mother of invention, then people who live under con constant conditions of constraint have to be some of the most creative people out there. Pent up demand with an understanding of real needs has led to a lot of creative uses of technology out there, innovation at the grassroots level, which has also led to a blossoming of top-down, meets bottom-up partnerships. Notice I say partner. Partnering of equals. Establishing a feedback loop, because each party to the partnership brings unique information, capacities, skills, knowledge that the other needs. Everybody has something to offer here. And by forming a partnership with feedback loops, we can learn from each other. We can work together. It takes commitment, though. But there's a silver lining for technology. <laughs> it's enabling us to work together as never before possible. I think this is a very exciting time to be part of these partnerships. They can take many forms, too. Public-private partnerships. They can involve universities. There's no set cookie-cutter form for what they look like. And that allows for a lot of creativity. I'm involved in a lot of them, and I think that this is a really promising way for us to move forward. Speaking of working together, this is the Solomon Islands. I was fortunate enough to go there to look at another Computers in the Schools deployment um, August of last year. The school. Again, most of the ecosystem components were in place, so we had a vibrant usage of the Computers in the Schools by both the teachers and the students. But what really affected me on this trip, actually of this whole trip, was when 20 parents of these kids showed up to tell me how this Computers in the Schools program had impacted their lives. And the language barrier just melted away as each one of them went around. We were sitting in a circle, went around the room, and told me the whole family dynamic had changed. Their kids had become teachers of themselves and I mean, the parents and of the other kids, they were now excited to go to school. There were no sick days because everybody wanted to go to school to use the computers. They had changed the entire dynamic of the community, even. The community was now suddenly, for the first time, involved and interested in the education of the kids. They were all getting together and becoming a community. And it was so exciting until I realized the real reason that they had come from near and far, on foot and by canoe, to come and talk to me. As they, one by one, started pleading with me, please, don't let our project get abandoned. Please, don't abandon us. And unfortunately, that scenario has repeated itself at every single OLPC deployment that I have visited that's been in place for over a year. Please, don't let us be abandoned. You know what? We can do better. 
we can work together. I can't do this alone, but I'm not doing it alone. I have contacts, I have resources, I have connection to the internet. I can use technology, it's at my disposal, and I can take advantage of it, and I am. I've started a blog, I've started projects at my university. I get to give a talk at TED today to all of you. And you know what? You can make a difference too, because you have contacts, you have resources, you have technology at your disposal. You can get involved and you can make a difference too. Let's not abandon these projects. Next story, <laughs> final story actually. Um, in 2009, I was fortunate enough to go and do research on a nationwide Computers in the Schools initiative in Macedonia. About a week into being there, I met the Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist project of that school. We, or of the program, I'm sorry, the project. We decided to work together. Thank goodness. <laughs> we realized that I had resources and information that she needed and she, vice versa. She had resources, knowledge, etc. that I needed. Two months later, with the help of many, many people, we had an incredible data set of um, surveys and interviews of hundreds of teachers and students across the entire country of Macedonia. And then I went home, and through the wonders of modern technology, we kept working together. We've co-authored papers, we've presented at multiple conferences about our findings, we've had them published on the websites. So for an academic, this is a really good job of getting the word out. But Maya is a practitioner, and I'd like to tell you what she did. She went back to the actual training of the teachers, which is what we were writing about. And she incorporated all of the best practices that we had recommended. She changed the curriculum for the entire nation. That gives me goosebumps. <laughs> that makes me feel like these kids in the, in the picture. Yay, that's change I can believe in, right? Two people working together, the academic and the practitioner really making a difference in the world. So back to this picture. It still moves me. I still use it because there's value in it, because every time I look at it, I see hope for that better education, for that brighter future, for increased opportunities. And so if I can get all of you to remember when you see this picture, that there's an entire ecosystem missing from it. That the whole difficult, long slog we know of as development that takes human activity and commitment is missing from that picture. If you know that, then I've done something really good, right? <laughs> if you know that, we can start working together. We can take advantage of technology. We can talk to each other. We can take advantage of all of the different skills that we bring to this great big world. And I know that together, we can make a huge difference. Thank you.